Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, today I will be chairing this morning session, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, and invite to listen the second part of Bioimaging and Processing by Professor Tatiana Aleva. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so, good morning. Uh, today I will split uh, the, uh, the topics in two. So one of them will be a continuation of the yesterday talk about the problems of the quantitative bioimaging with wide field microscopy and another one will be dedicated to the design of some special draping tools in order to transport uh, the multiple uh, particles of the micro and nano size. So let us continue with, with what we uh, have uh, uh, discussed yesterday. So I will refresh a little bit uh, some content. So we are speaking about the biological images, biological uh, like a cellular, and they are quite, oh, it's always, okay. Uh, so uh, the problem is that they have a very bad absorption contrast. But, uh, so, and we can treat it like a face-only object. So the first guess was, if we are able to reconstruct the face uh, of our image, maybe we have to know something about uh, the sample. And so there were develop, developed uh, several techniques which uh, for, for this purpose, uh, based uh, on the iterative uh, algorithms, interferometry and holography, transport of intensity equation, and phase based tomography, uh, to name a few of them, maybe there is a, uh, this is the main category which are doing this phase retrieval from the intensity measurements, because the intensity measurements, this is the only one that we can uh, permit in uh, uh, optical, um, for, for, for wavelength. Wave, wave um, so uh, we considered the different uh, uh, algorithms and uh, we said, okay, we can uh, manage to get the phase. Uh, sometimes when we consider the iterative algorithms, we recover the phase of the illumination beam together with the scattering beam. If we consider uh, the holographic uh, uh, picture, so we try to recover only the scattering beam, but anyhow, this is the beam which is, uh, in, uh, uh, which corresponds to the image and not to what we have scattered before entering to the uh, objective. So, but the objective has its own point spread function. And so in order to know something about the object itself and not about its image, we have to get out from this uh, uh, um, point spread function somehow. So there are several also methods to do it. Uh, and uh, uh, for this purpose, uh, we have uh, to consider firstly how we can uh, resolve the Helmholtz equations in, uh, during the propagation through the sample. And uh, in that case, uh, we can represent these Helmholtz equations, which by the way, this is a wave equations, but uh, wave equation, but in the case, when we consider monochromatic wave and the scalar approximation. So uh, we can represent it in this form where, where uh, we have uh, uh, something which is corresponds to the propagation in the homogeneous medium, but this is N0 stand for the mounting medium where we put our uh, cellular, for example, so in the cell, for example, so in this case, it's correspond to the water or uh, its uh, uh, proper environment. And uh, here we have uh, um, th 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 the modulation of this refractive index, which corresponds to our sample, which we exactly want to measure. So this perturbation of uh, refractive index, it's quite a small, but our goal is to recover that from our measurements. So uh, this is uh, what we call like, a optic, uh, like a optical potential. So we first solve uh, this equation in the homogeneous medium, and after that we consider the different approximation 
uh, in order to get the information about the refractive index of the sample. So uh, there are also different approximations to do this. One of them is a paroxysmal approximation when we consider the accumulation of the refractive index during the propagation through the cell, for example. Uh, uh, um, um, no, it is a canal approximation and paroxysmal approximation when we consider that the scattering is in uh, uh, the small angles, which is related, by the way, to the uh, uh, approximation uh, to the method when, uh, which, which we used uh, to recover uh, uh, the phase information using the transport of intensity equations. But uh, if we want to go further, if we don't want to use a paroxysmal approximation, so we can think about how to resolve the entire um, Helmholtz equation with other different uh, approximation, and one of them might be the Born approximation, which considers the small perturbation or uh, perturbation of the refractive index, and then it uh, uh, considering that uh, the field what we recover is equal to the uh, on, uh, the field of the illumination, which is staying here, and then we consider the different uh, order of perturbations and in particular usually consider the first one, which is related in general with the scattering of the light through this uh, object. So you see that the Born approximation is linear with respect to complex field amplitude. But another uh, approximation is a Ritter one, when we don't uh, think that this, uh, don't consider that this uh, um, uh, variation of the refractive index is too small, but we uh, uh, have to uh, um, our limitation of this method that we consider that the gradient of the refractive uh, index are quite smooth. So they are not very big. So uh, in the first case, in the Born approximation, we consider only single scattering. And so if we remember uh, the Gabor picture, Gabor uh, holographic picture, so in that case, we don't consider the diffraction of uh, um, the interference of the scattering, uh, scattered uh, beam with itself, we only consider the interference of the scattering beam with the illuminated beam. So this is the limitation of the Born approximation. And uh, in the, the rate of a case, uh, so, uh, so we consider so only the one act of a scattering. While in the rate of approximation, uh, it is uh, uh, not linear with respect to the perturbation, and uh, this is linear with respect to its phase, which in general this phase is a complex function because it also incorporates the amplitude information and the phase. So it's only represented as this exponential form, and uh, therefore it is multiplicative with respect to complex field amplitude. And this method in general takes into account the multiple um, Scattering, and that means that it takes into account the uh, diffraction of the uh, scattering uh, light with itself. So somehow it is more rich comparing with the Born approximation. Uh, so we have considered yesterday uh, how this approximation works and the different application of that, in particular for the different type of the tomography. This is a phase tomography, which is based uh, uh, on the applications uh, uh, of the a canal approximation. After that, uh, the, the scientists go further, so they consider already the first born approximation, taking into account the diffraction, and uh, there is uh, the 2P digital holographic microscopy by the way, uh, the inventor of this method, they uh, even found their own company, and uh, so it, the method is working quite, quite well. But after that, we decided that it's probably a good idea to get uh, out of uh, the um, uh, disturbance, uh, which is related to the propagation through the objective, which is cutting the certain frequency of case, we, we, uh, the frequency which cut by the objective, we never can uh, recover it. But uh, what we can do, we can 
uh, to change the weight uh, 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 of this uh, frequency in order to, it's like in the uh, whatever linear uh, system which have uh, the point spread function, you can uh, make the deconvolution if you know information about it. So this is the same uh, idea. And so um, uh, uh, the scientists applied it as for the coherent, as for the partially coherent light that we discussed yesterday also. But uh, at the beginning for the applications uh, of the firstborn uh, approximation. And uh, after that, uh, we have, so, so this is uh, uh, the, the 3D uh, phase optical transfer function, which allow us if we uh, uh, to make this deconvolution depending on the degree of coherence of uh, our, uh, our beam. measuring the intensity, the three dimensional stack of the intensity distribution. Uh, now let us say, uh, let us speak about the rate of approximation. So we have uh, uh, till now two different uh, way to thinking about how uh, the information about the refractive index is incorporated in our stack of the intensity distribution because in the case of the uh, when, when we started with the phase retrieval, we said, okay, we say something about the accumulation of the optical path passing through the sample. But from the uh, born point of view, when we, when we used uh, the first uh, order approximation of the uh, first order born approximation, so we supposed that every scattering is independent and it doesn't relate one with respect to another one, and only the interference of the scattered uh, light from the every this scattering is interfering with what? With the illumination, with the background illumination. So it seems that it is quite opposite point of view on the formation of our uh, of our image. So let us see if the rate of approximation help us to make the bridge between both these uh, um, limits, I would say. So uh, in that case, uh, we consider our complex field amplitude, which is uh, the, the real amplitude and the phase, in the exponential ma manner. So uh, this is C stay for the uh, uh, logarithm, natural algorithm. Uh, of the amplitude, which is uh, positive, of course, and its phase. And now let us substitute this expression in the Helmholtz equation. When we do it, we obtain these modified equations. Uh, uh, up till now, we don't uh, uh, make any approximations, so it is only we, we change the notations. No? Now, let us consider, so, and we is, uh, as you remember, this is uh, our goal. We want to recover the optical potential. So, uh, let us uh, first, as we did also with the Born approximation, resolve the problem of homogeneous equation. It means that when optical potential is equal to zero, and then we obtain the first, uh, the, the zero, zero approximation, which is our, a beam which is propagated without any sample, at least. And uh, let us consider now uh, this phase P, uh, P, uh, uh, C1 is a perturbation phase which is appear during the scattering when our light propagates through the, uh, through the, through the object. So in that case, when we um, uh, add this uh, additional term in our equations, no, no, uh, noticing that this one is uh, the solution when V is equal to zero, so we obtain the equation for the first approximation. And if we make a, a small mathematics and to arrange it in the several, the, 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 this form, we 
find that it is very similar what we have uh, uh, had for the Born approximation uh, if we consider this like uh, our new function and if we consider this as a uh, new optical potential. So this is optical potential and plus these terms. So we can rewrite uh, the integral presentation of the differential equations, and this is this one. So it is very similar what we have for the Born approximation, but in Born approximation we have this part, which is staying for the complex field amplitude adding as the first approximation, if we cut this part and if we don't uh, use the, this uh, normalization of the uh, input field. Um, but now we are staying in the first order rate of approximation. And of course, it is impossible to resolve directly this equation because here you have also information about uh, uh, this psi one that we want to recover. So what we can do, we can resolve this equation also in its first approximation. So we suppose that uh, the gradients uh, of, the, uh, of uh, this uh, C, which is an exponential uh, form of our uh, complex field amplitude like we, like we wrote it, is too small, and therefore we can drop it. What is uh, the price of doing this? So we suppose the slow changes of the refractive index on the scale of lambda, which is the wavelength. And therefore, we obtained this quite nice uh, expression, which relate the Born approximation with the Ritter one. So we can say that in the first order uh, rate of approximation and also with this cutting of this term, we obtain that uh, the field is equal to the, our initial unscattering field, and as uh, the exponential, we have the first born approximation term divided to the first uh, to, to the uh, complex field amplitude for the unscattering field. Um, the nice thing of this approximation that it takes the multiple for forward only uh, uh, scattering, so it is already uh, better than, um, than the first Born approximation, but it's more difficult probably uh, to, to use this approximation to calculate uh, the things um, uh, and uh, to, to recover the information about the um, optical potential because, because this term is stand in the exponential. So now let us look what is the connection between the econal equation and the first born approximation if we are staying with the first order rate of approximation. So uh, if we only use uh, the first two term of the uh, of uh, this exponential Taylor Series, uh, Taylor series, so we get exactly what we have for the first uh, order Born approximation. So it means that we have to suppose that perturbation are too weak in order to uh, take here only the first two terms of the Taylor series. On the other case, if we consider that the scattering angle is too small, and uh, where uh, here L is a distance of propagation and S is a perturbation scale um, of the refraction, refractive index. So in that case, the rate of approximation is reduced to the econal equation, uh, approximation. And therefore, we have this phase accumulation uh, due to uh, the optical path difference uh, between the light passing through the object and the uh, light passing apart. So we see that uh, probably the rate of approximation is more, um, more clear because it's considered in uh, two limited cases, both 
approximation is a canal which the people are using when they considering uh, the uh, the phase. Uh, so, so this is uh, there are a lot of uh, papers which consider the recovering of the face and representing the, the thickness of, of the of the cells. And uh, the uh, born, first born approximation, which is usually used for the diffraction optical tomography. But um, of course, this is uh, also approximation. And so the people are st uh, uh, thinking about the following. Maybe all of this approximation is not sufficient to get the information about the optical potential. Because the question is that we want to see some details, which sometimes it, uh, uh, the scale is less than the wavelength scale. Why? Because we consider uh, the microscope, which has a resolution, the normal resolution is the, uh, at least is the wavelength divided by, by, by two or, or even three. So it, it depends on the uh, numerical aperture that we have. And so uh, one of the idea is uh, to use the neural network to recover the information about the optical potential. So one or there are several papers uh, about this, but uh, this is in particular is from, uh, from quite recent. Uh, from the paper of Camille, and this is a group of scientists, and uh, they decided uh, to use this uh, neural network in order to uh, um, recover the information about our sample. So they present the sample, which is in this case, for example, is a combination of a two sphere is, uh, is uh, the different layers. So in general, they consider it like a, a box of 40 by 40 microns, which are divided to the voxel, and every voxel is more or less uh, 70 nanometers. And uh, they consider it uh, um, 420 layers. And uh, after that, they say, okay, how the light propagates through my sample? So they consider that they have, uh, 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 in every layer, they, in every voxel, they change the face, because they consider the, the, the face uh, only object, but they don't know exactly how to change it. So the, the first guess, they are changing it accordingly with the first one approximation that they obtained using the normal uh, optical diffraction tomography. And after that, they propagate the light from one layer to another one using the Fresnel diffraction. And uh, after that, they compare what they have with uh, the, uh, directly with the hologram, because this is the digital holographic microscopy method when they used also the different inclinations, so it is similar uh, method that we discussed uh, for the 2P uh, optical, uh, optical tomography. And uh, uh, so they uh, do it for 80 angles and, uh, uh, and using uh, the back propagation error algorithm, after uh, 100 iteration, they recover the optical potential, and they have the following result. So this is the initial object. So this is the field before the object. So th this is what they use for the, for, 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 for the measurements. And this is uh, the reconstructions uh, of the diffraction term when they use the Born approximation for this method. So you see that they have, uh, they, that if we use directly this uh, uh, optical diffraction tomography method reco uh, reconstruction. So you have here the information about the refractive index, which doesn't exist. Uh, here, where it is representing uh, these two balls uh, in X and Z direction, it is prolongated, which is quite uh, known in general effect because, because of the, the famous missing call that we, uh, Colin Shepard probably explained you several days ago, right? 
And uh, here you have uh, this in E Y direction. So what will happen when they use this learned algorithm? So you don't have any field before uh, the uh, the sample before this uh, ball starting. Here they have uh, the refractive uh, index in X Z, and this is in E Z direction. So it seems that it is working, but it is, uh, of course, very time consuming because you have to, uh, to learn your system to, to recover it. And uh, of course, you see that we move from the optics more and more to the digital processing. And the digital processing sometimes is working well, but sometimes it may be like a trick, and so we recover something, but maybe it is not wrong. So, this is a different uh, uh, approaches that uh, the people are trying to, to apply it, uh, in order to solve this uh, complex uh, pro uh, problem of the reconstruction of the three-dimensional information of uh, our um, images. So something similar, it was done also by Tian and Laura Waller. Uh, so, uh, not exactly with, uh, with uh, a neural network, but also with some, uh, some iterative processes, uh, but uh, using uh, uh, not uh, diffraction tomography, uh, not, not uh, the holographic method, but another one. So, and there are also uh, other uh, papers related to that. So now uh, let us say a few words about the possibility how we can, so we're starting to think that there are a different method of the illumination. So we, we're speaking about the coherent and partially coherent light and what is better in one, one aspect and another one. So how we can quickly change one type of the illumination to the another one? Because of course you can do it moving your uh, closing and opening your diaphragm in the back focal plane of the uh, of the, your condenser, but it is uh, not uh, not suitable because we usually want to get the information very quickly. So, if you want to play with a coherent and partially coherent light, to use this inclined illumination and tetra, so maybe we have uh, to think about a, a certain. Uh, um, Uh, a certain um, uh, element which help us to do it. So, uh, one of the proposal is uh, is used uh, the uh, the uh, DPL projector. So it is something similar that we use it here, but it's more or less uh, it's not so so expensive probably like that one. So you can buy it uh, maybe for six hundred euro or even less. And uh, uh, what is the good things uh, of this projector? First of all, it has three le uh, LEDs, and so you can work with the three different illuminations, so that we red, green, and blue. Uh, then it is uh, incorporates the digital mirror devices. You can buy the digital mirror devices apart, which are very, very expensive, but this, for the illumination purpose, it's quite, quite good. Uh, uh, the digital, uh, the, the mirrors, they don't have chromatic aberration, which is also a, a good a good thing, and they are, have a very uh, fast response in order to create the images. And uh, um, the, the, the uh, DPL uh, used before also for other um, type of the microscopy, in particular for the uh, structured illuminations, and for contrast enhancement imaging. And the last, one, uh, the last one, by the way, it is similar what is, uh, what is corresponds to the uh, uh, coherence engineering. Because in this case, for the contra uh, contrast enhancement imaging, what they use is that they put the different filters, so they project using uh, this projector the different images to the back focal plane of the condenser. So that's exactly what we are doing. But the difference is that 
in this application, they, they are used for uh, the uh, normal absorption of the, um, of the images, while now we can apply all this algorithm that we discussed before, recover the, the quantity of information about the images. There are also alternative proposals for uh, to uh, fast changing of the kind of the illuminations, which is uh, the LED uh, array illumination, which was used in this, in particular in these papers. Uh, so, how we can do it? So, you buy this as a projector, you remove the lens, which project uh, what we have here to the screen, and you adapt your optics in order to project this uh, uh, information that you have in your display. For example, it might be a circle, triangle, or whatever you want, to the back focal plane of your, uh, uh, of your condenser. And with that, you can design your also, uh, so uh, your image, uh, cannot to be binary, so it might be even you, you can uh, design uh, the different type of the intensity distribution there. You can to play with the different colors, and uh, therefore uh, you can design the different uh, uh, way to make the imaging playing with this uh, coherence uh, degree of uh, uh, diversity of your imaging formation which might be helpful for the reconstruction of the 3D objects. So, uh, this, so the images that I showed you before in the beginning, yesterday in the beginning of the talk when you uh, see the, ball, uh, the, the balls which are imaging and it's not clear what is corresponding to what if it is a sphere or not, it's corresponding with this type of uh, um, application of this type of the system. And as I told you, you also have uh, the, the different type of uh, wavelets, and so uh, it is also useful uh, in certain application, for example, in the method of the uh, unwrapping or, or uh, to study uh, the uh, dependence of the refractive index on the wavelengths, because we know there is a famous Cauchy law that they, they are different. Uh, in fact, the index with respect to the wavelets. So, uh, oh, maybe I will go here. So, uh, as a conclusions. Uh, he, he, you see uh, the, the, the proposal of, uh, of, the, um, of this, uh, of, uh, this uh, um, of Samson and Blanco, which used also uh, the, uh, the DLP projector to project the different pictures uh, to the condenser uh, aperture, and uh, they tried to simulate, the, uh, to, to, to have the well-known uh, different uh, style of um, illumination that we know like a dark field, which is almost dark field that we have here, like a uh, Heinberg uh, um, illumination when we do it with a different color of the, uh, of the rings in order to separate the uh, different type of the low and high frequencies and to see it, it's like like an optical staining, hmm? and uh, you also have to have the brick illumination. You also can uh, uh, to use uh, this type of illumination for uh, the tomographic purpose if you put it like a different points uh, in uh, in time sequence. So you have this oblique illumination which might be coherent if uh, this, uh, this part will be too small and then to make the optical uh, diffraction tomography as we discussed before. So there are a lot of opportunity using uh, this, uh, 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 this 
proposal for the coherence um, engineering, uh, it will get uh, a, a lot of uh, possibility to uh, recover the image. So finally, what I want to say is that uh, in general, uh, this uh, method which we discussed yesterday and today about the 2D and 3D quantitative imaging, it is a realization of the ideas proposed in general in last century, but realizable only now because we have the computational facility that the people didn't have uh, 50 years ago. So, of course, there is something, uh, something nuanced, but mostly they are uh, based on these uh, on, on these uh, old ideas. And I want to say also uh, to you that uh, here I cited some papers, but that it, uh, uh, there are a lot of them. So it is a very small percentage that I did this. So I want to apologize for the some after which have a very good works, but uh, were not cited uh, here. And uh, I want also to transmit you the following message. In spite uh, that uh, there are a lot of things which uh, have been done, there are also a lot of things that you can uh, do if you want, because there are uh, several problems, or not several, many problems to solve, because we want to fast data acquisition, a fast data processing, so uh, we have uh, to think, uh, we have the law for the high frequency, we have uh, usually the low signal noise ratio, so we can think how to increase it. Um, we need the some rigorous method of reconstruction, maybe using again um, uh, the neural network, but with, of course, with some knowledge of the optics, because otherwise it will not work at all. Uh, we have to think about the proper sampling, about the correct illumination. We have to solve this unwrapping problem, which is uh, quite difficult if we want to measure the sickness uh, and the regularization method, because we are speaking about the deconvolution, uh, deconvolution. Mathematically, it's very simple. So you only have, uh, if, if you have the relation with uh, uh, in the uh, shift invariant sig uh, system between your signal and the point spread function of the your linear system. So in the Fourier domain, it's only multiplication. So it seems that it's nothing to do. You divide it and you have already the things, but it's not the case because you, when you divide it and when uh, the um, transfer function has the small value, so you enlarge the noise, and so it doesn't work. So there are a lot of regularization problems in this case. And uh, so finally, I would like to uh, thank my colleague, who, uh, my, my colleague who helped with this, uh, Jose Rodrigo and Juan uh, Soto, who helped with uh, certain figures, which is experimental figure obtained with our design. Uh, of course, I would like to thank uh, the college organizer, which is this nice, uh, um, College that uh, I, I am here only for a few days, but I, I really enjoy it. And uh, our our uh, project from the Ministry of Economy and uh, Competitiveness, which for the financial support of some experimental results that I demonstrated here. So, uh, and of course, I would like to thank to you. So, uh, I don't know if you want to ask some question now or we move to another part, which is related to the optical trapping. Thank you for a very nice presentation, good mathematics and some practical aspects. Maybe anybody has a question to ask? Okay, first uh, I can ask you, Tatiana, uh, can be this mathematics uh, can be applied for uh, describing metamaterials? Uh, in, uh, for example, uh, uh, these kinds of approximation can be used or not? Or maybe, maybe yes, but it depends also on what is the size. Because when you're saying about uh, metamaterials, so it's probably you are speaking about negative refraction index. It's negative refractive index, maybe. But I never, I never seen it directly how they resolve, resolve it for this uh, 
but, but I think, yes, it's possible, probably. Any question? I mean, it, it depends on what level you want to do it. So it depends on the, on the size of the wavelengths with the details of your metamaterials because it consists of the, some superposition of the small details. So what exactly you want to get from that? Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, on your slide about the DMDs, the use of a, you said you, have, uh, you can use a projector. Yes. A video projector for that. But um, actually when we had experience when using a projector, we found out that there are, due to the pixel nature of the uh, DMD Hi. itself, there are a lot of diffraction orders over there. So um, using the video projector, is that the same case here or it's, Totally different no, case. but 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 what we what we're doing also we put uh, some uh, diffuser. Ah, uh, so it, it's yeah. needed. Diffuser is needed. Thank so you. It will help you. Nobody else. Okay, we have enough time i think we can make a short we don't have enough time ah, because now it's second the second time okay okay let's continue so, the second yeah so now we move to another part and this part is related to the optical beam configuration for the manipulation of micron and nanoparticles and this uh, work is mostly done uh, uh, mostly related to the original research so it was done with a collaboration of the uh, dr rodrigo uh, and so he, I, I include his name in this representation also. Um, so, uh, first of all, we will speak about the light like an instrument for the small particle manipulation. I saw that last week, uh, next week, you have some, um, some representation also which is related with the optical tweezers. So it is a picture that I have to speak before, but uh, let us, so I, I will speak only the basic things about that. So um, the interaction between the light and the, uh, the uh, which, uh, and, uh, um, and the particles, it's uh, a very known effect. Uh, it uh, uh, was uh, uh, even thinking on also almost, uh, 400 years ago by Kepler when he wrote his uh, famous, uh, famous book, The Cometis, when he realized that the light radiation pressure pushed the small object along the beam propagation direction and they uh, deflect the comet tails, which consist of very small particles, uh, in the direction uh, out from the sun. But, uh, the first laboratory, uh, but the first laboratory experiments uh, on this stuff were made only at the beginning of the last century by Lebedev, uh, Nikos, and uh, independent Ledu, and uh, it is uh, in the same year, by the way. So they demonstrate that uh, exactly this uh, radiation pressure forces exist. But uh, after the invention of laser, the Ashkin and uh, his collaborators they have found that this radiation pressure can be used for optical manipulation of the micro particles and now also in nanoparticles. And uh, uh, now it has a lot of uh, uh, applications in, uh, for uh, micro nanoparticle control confinement, respiration, uh, uh, cell surgery, molecular motors, uh, atomic, uh, atom cooling, etc. Uh, so, in the biomedical application, it's also very important. Uh, so, there are a single molecule studies like uh, motor proteins, uh, RNA and DNA mechanism interaction, uh, DNA protein interaction. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, how it is working, so I recommend you to, uh, to see in YouTube this lecture, which has a link. When, I, 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 when you will see this presentation in the uh, Winter College site, so you can only push this button and it will be redirected you to this, to this lecture. So it is a biological application of that. 
So in general, what we used, uh, uh, the optical tweezer used for this molecular study, it doesn't mean that you drop the molecule, you drop uh, the, um, the particle, which is the, maybe the 500 um, nanometers size, which attach to this molecule. So don't see that you, don't think that you, uh, you, uh, you make this manipulation with this particle. And uh, uh, also there are uh, a lot of uh, stuff uh, in the field of single cell confinement um, for the measurement of the volume change and mechanical characterization of the cell, cell surgeries, etc. Also it is important for cell transportation for the sorting, um, um, and it is a good idea because you cannot contaminate your sample because you don't touch them. You used only the light for that, and for ensembling, organizing, etc. So there are another um, review that you can uh, look up. So probably the first uh, experiments which was done uh, by Ashkin and also his colleague uh, on the optical manipulation into cell. It is this one. Of course, it's not uh, look so nicely like uh, the modern picture of the um, uh, trapping uh, inside, but you see that this particle, the small particle, they move from this point to that, like you see in this uh, inside of the of the cell, and uh, is it moving like that, etc. So, but of course, it's uh, almost more than 30 years ago. Uh, um, the people uh, think about to make the micro machines driving by light. So they made the some uh, micro instruments like that, and uh, they engineering them in a, such a way that they can be uh, pushed to the rotation when they illuminated by the usual, the normal Gaussian beam because of the configuration of this motor. But uh, can we do something different? Can we use, for example, the normal uh, spherical balls and to move them with a special light that we are prepared for this purpose? So this is something which is contrary to what uh, we see here. So the light is Gaussian, but the form of the particle is it such that it can be moved. But we may uh, to, uh, try to... Uh, um, to reverse the problem, so the light will be designed and the particle will be the simplest one. Uh, so now you can even buy uh, the optical tweezer, so there are at least uh, two companies, uh, which is a very different approach to represent uh, their product. So one is from the Sorglas, which is more scientific and it is more applicable, it seems, it's uh, like that. And uh, now let us speak about the optical forces. So let's suppose that uh, we have uh, the light with this color picture with a complex field amplitude uh, describing by the amplitude and the phase. And uh, there are uh, two parts of this scattering uh, of these forces. So one of them, which uh, called usually like uh, scattering forces, it is proportional to the optical current or optical flux which is the product of the intensity distribution of this point multiplied by the gradient of the phase. So it is this uh, phase, uh, this, this force, which will help us to move the particle on the um, around, um, uh, around the curve that we want to design in order to move them and to make something similar to the motor, uh, uh, micro machines that I show you before, but for the simplest particles. And uh, another uh, part uh, of the forces are proportional to the intensity gradient. This is a conservative forces and uh, they are proportional to the gradient of the intensity. So this force uh, is uh, responsible for the trapping of the particle. Um, uh, if we are speaking about the particle, so uh, there are three regimes 
different depends on the size of the particle. So there's a mini regime, so where the diameter is uh, uh, much more than the wavelengths. In spite of we are saying that it is much more, in general, it's, if it's uh, more than 10 uh, wavelengths, it's more or less okay to apply this, uh, um, um, this regime. Another one is a really regime when the D is much smaller than lambda. But of course, how much smaller? So usually if it's uh, the, uh, smaller or more or less in the size of lambda, we can say that it is also possible to apply. And uh, the intermediate regime is, in general, it's more complex and they describe like Lawrence Mee model. And uh, uh, if you want uh, to learn more about that, you can look to the following uh, paper which is cited here. So let us consider the simple things that we consider the Mee regime. So it can be treated in the uh, ray optics model. So you have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the plane wave, you have a particle, and we look to two, ra uh, two rays, B and A. And if it is a plane wave, so uh, the light refract in the particle, so we consider the, the particle uh, with the refractive index, which is larger than in the mounting medium, and so uh, the, uh, the ray propagate in that direction, the B-ray propagate in that direction, but this is refraction and the, this ball provoke uh, the, the forces on the particle which are opposite uh, the, uh, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the force uh, which uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, corresponding to the light refraction. And uh, the same happened in that case with the uh, uh, array A, and therefore in that case you have only, uh, when you sum all these forces, the only force that you have is in the direction of the scattering, and so your particle will move in that direction. But let us now consider if I don't have the plane wave and I have a Gaussian profile. So again, we have uh, two rays, but this ray B, B has a less intensity, I would say. So it's less intensive than A. And therefore, its force we will be um, more weak than the force that I have from the, um, from the ray A. And therefore, we have the force which will uh, move the particle in the Z direction, in the direction of uh, beam propagation, but we also will have this gradient forces which will move the particle in the region when the intensity distribution is larger. So this is, in general, the idea of optical trapping. Why the particle trapped in the uh, level when we have uh, the larger intensity distribution? Sorry? Yes, it's not. No, it's moving, yes. But it's moving, uh, it's moving in bo both directions. So it's moving in this direction and in that, right? So it's still moving if we consider this, uh, this, uh, this beam, but it's moved in that direction and also in the direction of beam propagation, right? But now, if we will focus it, so the situation will change. So if we will focus it, so we will have the intensity gradients in the direction which will compensate this scattering force which is in the direction of propagation. So this is uh, uh, the, of course we, we, we can, so, so this, this, is, uh, uh, this is the simplest uh, picture you have, of course, integrate over your, these forces over all the, uh, the, the object, in this case is the sphere. 
So in the case when we have uh, the particles which have the refractive index which is lower than the mounting medium, so the situation is inverse, and so your particle will move outside of the, in, in the direction contrary uh, to the, uh, our uh, intensity gradients. Now, if you want to trap the particles, so uh, as uh, your colleague uh, uh, mentioned, so you need some seekers because your particles in general propagate in the direction in the direction of beam propagation. So you have to focus it, and this focusing have to be too strong uh, enough in order to. No, it, it's probably it, it's probably later we will see it. Okay, let us look at it. So it has to be uh, strong enough in order to compensate this is scattering forces. So here you can also look to this, uh, uh, to this website where you can play and, and how we can to focus them. You can focus them using the high numerical aperture of your microscope. So uh, here uh, you can find uh, this uh, website where you can play with a different part of the uh, numerical aperture and to see how depending on that your particle can propel in the direction of the beam propagation or can stop and can be trapped inside of this, uh, of this um, optical trap. So, but now let us return a little bit back and let us consider uh, the uh, forces uh, on the submicron uh, uh, relay, partic uh, relay particles. So let us uh, consider the dielectrical particles and we again can separate uh, the forces to the two parts. So one of them is the gradient forces, as I said you before, which are proportional to the gradient of the intensity distribution. And this also called like a lens, uh, like property of the scatter, because it's moved uh, to the uh, direction of the gradient of the intensity. It, what is doing the lens when it's focusing it, if the lens is um, co uh, convergent, or it's moved outside of that if the lens is divergent. And this is depends on what? Depends on the difference of the refractive index of the medium, medium and the particles. So on the other side, the scattering uh, forces are proportional to the intensity distribution and gradient of the phase. And as you see here, they are always are in the direction because there, you have a square here, so they are always in the direction of the phase gradient. Uh, here it depends on if uh, on the refractive index of the particle and the medium, while in that case not, that they always are in the direction of the phase gradient. Um, so we discussed it here. So what we, uh, what I want to discuss with you is how to move a particle. So we see that it's very easy to move it in the direction of beam propagation, but may we, uh, can we make something uh, uh, other thing? Can we move it in the transfer plane? Can we move it along the design trajectory in 3D? How and how to do it? Uh, so, first of all, we can, of course, to trap the particle and move this trap, uh, but uh, uh, there are other possibility like uh, beam shaping. So, we will speak more about the beam shaping. So, we will speak about how to draw the two-dimensional curve of arbitrary form and uh, what are the requirements for the particle confinement and transport uh, uh, along of this curve and uh, what we understand on the all optical uh, trapping. How to propel, uh, I will show you how to propel the micron in nanoparticles along this trajectory and introduce the concept of this polymorphic uh, beam. And uh, then we will speak about how to go from the two-dimensional curve to the three-dimensional, which allow us to move the particle in direction which is a contrary to the beam propagation direction. Of course, with what? Using this uh, um, phase gradient forces. 
And uh, after that, we speak a little bit about how to create such type of the trap. So, uh, if uh, we, uh, we understand how we can trap the particle, for example, which have the refractive index, which is larger than uh, the medium with the uh, normal uh, Gaussian trap, but it's, usually it's not a Gaussian, it's a diffraction uh, uh, free um, uh, spot uh, uh, trap. So if now we want, and so we compensate the scattering forces in the direction of the beam propagation, if now I move it, I want to move it in uh, uh, a certain direction in uh, one plane, what I have to do, I can move the spot temporarily. So uh, to move the spot temporarily, uh, I can do using the hologram. So adding the uh, linear phase, we can move it in the direction, move it uh, along, uh, of, uh, uh, along the 2D plane. But we also can add in, uh, the uh, spherical uh, phase. And in that case, we can move this point in that direction. So it seems that it is quite easy to move the particles only adding something and uh, temporarily, and then to move this spot from uh, one point to another temporarily uh, related. But, but in that case, we can do it uh, with the certain particles which are in the volume with, where uh, in, in the spot when it is trapped. So the people um, did very nice things. For example, they trapped uh, different uh, particles in their own trap. So you have to design, for example, if here you have um, eight particle, you, particles, and you have to design their own movement of every particles, and it will be quite complicated uh, uh, hologram uh, um, design. And then you have to move it depending what you want every particle for separately. But uh, so it is a nice decision, uh, uh, solution for uh, some application. But after that, uh, the people uh, think about, but can we do the single B and to, so not time multiplexing it and to move and not maybe the only one particle, but the several particles is a certain trajectory. So the first uh, idea was to use the optical vortex beam with the helical phase, and this is correspond to the Laguerre uh, Gaussian uh, elliptical beams, hel helical beams, which uh, allow us to trap uh, the particles uh, along uh, along this uh, circular trajectory and, uh, uh, and um, move them. Why we can move them? Because we have the transversal gradient, which is, which is written here. So this gradient, this parameter L, is control how uh, big is uh, the phase gradient in the direction of particle movement along this circle. But uh, this trap existing, because there are a lot of examples of the similar, uh, similar solutions, and they try uh, different uh, type of the particles. So, for example, the particle with the refractive index with lower absorption, the, uh, lo lower than the mounting that can be trapped, but inside of the circle, if uh, the refractive index is larger, they can trap in that direction. But the problem of Laguerre Gaussian beam, which is a Ga uh, it's a still Gaussian, that we, we cannot trap uh, the particle inside of the sample. You need some help. And this help is a cover slip of your, of your chamber. So this is a bad idea if we want to use this trap for example, for the study of the dynamic of the particle, which is quite a complex uh, um, process, because, of course, we have to take into account, in that case, the forces, which are not only optical forces, but the forces also of this 
glass that we have the super, su uh, superface that uh, we have inside. So the people uh, uh, start thinking about how to create the normal, the, the proper three-dimensional, the true three-dimensional only optical drop. Um, there were also other proposals to use other very famous uh, now and very popular beams like uh, IRE beams which are moved along the parabolical trajectory and so it also was used for the optical trapping. So uh, here you see some, some, some uh, image uh, when the particles uh, from uh, this part of the chamber uh, using this, so this is the presentation of this uh, uh, IRE beam, which was moved to another quadrant of uh, these chambers. But uh, of course, uh, it is uh, quite limited. So if we always will be looking for certain already known solution, maybe uh, this solution is very limited. So why not to design uh, the beam for our uh, demand and not to use what we already know from some uh, uh, solutions of the equations that uh, uh, the people uh, know already. So uh, what, we, what we, we are applying? Instead of using the known form of the beam to design it uh, with what we want. But what are requirement for uh, particle confinement and transport because we would like not only to trap, we want to transport them and we want not to transport uh, particle by particle, we want to transport it in uh, such a way that we can do it for the individual particle or for the uh, many particles. So first of all, uh, we need to design the, bill, uh, the beam which intensity distribution follows the arbitrary curve because maybe we want to move it uh, depending on the situation. For example, we can uh, surround uh, the, uh, the cell or you can to transport it in a such a way that there are an obstacle. So we want to design, uh, to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to learn how to design the beam which are following the arbitrary curve in two dimensional and might be in three dimensional. So, uh, of course, we need a high density gradients because, or because we want to create the real three-dimensional trap and not uh, use the help of the superface. Uh, we also uh, want to manipulate the signal and the multiple particles. And uh, we, have, we want to manipulate the object with a different optical property and maybe size, so nano and micro particles. And we want to control the speed, how these particles are moving around uh, this designed curve. So it might be uniform or might be not uniform, it might be bigger or less, and it has to be independent on the form and the size of the curve. Um, and uh, of course we want to create, as I said, your three-dimensional trap. Uh, and maybe to speak, uh, to think about this planning motion, about the current situation, uh, to detecting uh, or avoiding uh, the, uh, the obstacle. So um, when we start thinking about that, we uh, found uh, the nice papers of Abramochkin and Valosnikov, and they planning to construct the spiral beam. So the spiral beam is a beam which are uh, which have the completely, may, may have the completely two-dimensional, uh, the form of the two-dimensional curve. And during the propagation, they doesn't change their, uh, they, uh, they don't change their shape, but uh, only enlarge uh, the scale during the uh, simple diffraction. So, um, you think, okay, maybe it will be useful to, uh, to, to use it for the trapping. And uh, let us think how they are constructing this, uh, th this beam. Uh, in general, we are starting to think about that because we have another proposal to construct with a similar spiral beam, but as a, as a super, uh, superposition of the Lager Gaussian beam. So it will be correct, but uh, it's not so easy to design the beam in the form that we are wanting to have finally. 
So uh, the idea of uh, realization of the Abrabochkin and Valusnikov is the following. So suppose uh, that uh, you want to design the beam in the form of the two-dimensional curve which are uh, written in the, polar, uh, in the polar coordinate with the radius r and uh, uh, the angle t. So what we have to do to design it? So uh, 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 the complex field amplitude for the beam which will follow this curve is written in the form of the superposition of the plane wave. So uh, uh, here you have x and y, which is a coordinate of your final um, coordinate of the, your final complex field amplitude. And uh, here you have a weight for this uh, plane wave, and this weight depends on that. It depends on the uh, uh, modulus of the uh, gradient of this uh, of this curve, uh, and uh, this term is say as that the intensity distribution along the curve is uh, almost uh, constant, which is a nice thing which we want also to have. Uh, then we have this term that in general corresponds to the brush, the, the form. Uh, of the profile the, that uh, uh, if we cut this curve, so we will have the profile of your uh, intensity distribution, and this profile will be Gaussian in that case. And uh, the next uh, term, it uh, responsible for creation these uh, spiral characters. So in that case, your, uh, it is a guarantee for the stability of your spiral beam. It means that the intensity distribution will not change during the propagation apart from the scaling. So uh, uh, in general, uh, there are a lot of possibility to construct them. So you try, for example, you can have it like that, like that, like that. And all of these beams with this, so this is intensity distribution and this is the phase will propagate it in a free space without change their form. So it is a nice thing. So Lager Gaussian beam belongs, of course, to this class. And uh, it was also shown that it's possible uh, to trap uh, the, uh, the particle and the move to, uh, along uh, this trajectory, but again against the, the cover slip. Uh, so what uh, we propose to do? Uh, first of all, since uh, we are uh, thinking about the real 3D trap, so we need the high transfers uh, uh, and the axial intensity gradients. And the Gaussian profiles will not give us uh, good axial intensity gradients. So we have to change something in this formula. And what we have changed, we change this Gaussian shape to one because now we have uh, uh, two domain. We have the representation of our signal in the domain which is similar uh, to what we have to the um, spiral beam, but the spiral beam is uh, is invariant apart from the rotation. So in Fourier transform, you will be exactly the same. But in our case, it will be not the case. So uh, we will have the different picture in the Fourier domain and in the trapping domain. So uh, uh, following the formula that I showed you before, we change this Gaussian brush to the spot one, which is correspond to uh, the uh, substitution of the Gaussian form to, uh, to one. And uh, after that, uh, we need uh, arbitrary control of uh, the phase gradient along the curve. So before, in this formula that I show you, the, intense, uh, the, the phase gradient along the curve uh, was fixed and uh, it was uh, described by this formula. Why? Because the idea of this spiral beam is to preserve their form during the rotation. But in general, we don't need it because we will trap our uh, particle in a, only in one plane, right? So we substitute it to this form, which I will explain you later. 
And uh, uh, so all, uh, after, after these changes, of course, we don't have uh, the, 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 the spiral characters of, uh, the be, uh, of the beam we lost, but it will acquire other uh, good properties that we would like to explore. So, uh, and this is a new expression for that. So you might be uh, uh, looking, uh, some people who are knowing something about the non-diffraction beam can say, okay, it is a very uh, similar to the non-diffraction beam. And it is true always when you get here the constant. So if R is a constant, you have a non-diffraction beam. If R is depend on T, it means that in the Fourier plane, you can to construct not only the ring, but whatever trajectory which is described by, by this R, uh, uh, depending on T formulas, you already have a diffraction beams, but which will uh, collapse to the uh, tiny focusing uh, curve in the Fourier plane. So, um, uh, uh, now, if we make the Fourier transform of this, so using the, our objective, so we will have uh, this, uh, this expression which corresponds to the tiny curve which we uh, pre-designed by the uh, uh, construction. So there are a lot of possibility uh, to design the curve. So one of them is to use the super formula which describes the shape of the plant and microorganism which was proposed by Gears when he studied the form of the, of the beams which is described by these many parameters type. So if you want, you can try this one, but in general, the method that work for whatever uh, uh, two-dimensional curve you like. So what now we get? So if you consider how the like Gear Gaussian beam, for example, uh, its uh, profile in the focusing plane and compare the same uh, uh, case for our type of a beam, that in the case of um, the circular trajectory transformed to the basal helical basal beam, so you see that here is a very nice transfer gradients, which is represented here, but which is more important, the very good axial uh, intensity gradient. And this axial intensity gradient allow us uh, to trap the particle inside of the sample and not only uh, against uh, the, the cover slip. So, um, it is uh, a good thing. And uh, if you want to know how we can design uh, this uh, type of the beams uh, but with a different uh, forms. So this is the intensity distribution of the representation in the hologram encoding plane. When we go to the trapping plane, they transform to the following uh, uh, form. So this is a theoretical one. I don't know if you see them. So this is what you, what you see uh, in the upper line. So this is theoretical prediction, and this is what we have managed. So we have uh, the very nicely defined the, uh, the spiral, the floor, uh, uh, flower, uh, et cetera. And uh, below, you have the phase distribution along them. Uh, now, uh, let us speak about this as a real 3D optical trap. Uh, the first uh, real 3D optical trap uh, was uh, um, experimentally demonstrated in uh, 2007 in, by Rochman and Greer, and they used for that the helical basal beam, which is a particular solution of our uh, general formula that we proposed. And uh, uh, indeed, they will be able uh, to trap and to move the particles along the circle and uh, the inside of the sample. Um, but uh, what we can do, we can, uh, maybe I will go to the, uh, to the formal. So this is the explanation how we can 
uh, how we can model uh, the propelling forces, the forces that allow us to move with a different uh, velocity our particle along the curves, so they are related to this, uh, with uh, this C, uh, ST term, and which will be uniform if this condition is satisfied, and non-uniform, for example, this on whatever you want, if, it's, if, they are, uh, if you don't want it. And here you see the representation of our beam, the intensity distribution, and the phase distribution in the different domains. So this is the domain where we, where we design them. So this is the upper line. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, face, uh, face of them. And on, the, oh, on this line, you have the representation in the trapping domain. And here you have the different distribution of the phase. So here is the first column corresponds to the uh, helical basal, uh, basal beam, which is very known. And this one is also ring. But the difference with this one is that the phase gradient along of this is not uniform. If it is not uniform, you see that it is also reflected in the form of, uh, of its Fourier transform of its hologram. You can, of course, make the same intensity gradient by variate the, uh, pardon, uh, the, same, uh, the same phase gradient along the curve, but variate the intensity gradient. That also will change the, uh, the forces which move the particle along, along that. Uh, so it's correspond to this uh, two parted, and uh, of course you can then play and to, to make uh, a lot of uh, different possibility to do that. So this is again the experimental demonstration of the uh, representation of this beam. And now let us uh, look how uh, it is working. And uh, we, uh, so this, uh, this picture corresponds to the trapping uh, forces um, uh, on the uh, on the silica one micron size spherical particles moved along the 2D trajectory. So this is a square. This is uh, this is a triangle. This is a road. so so this uh, this is a normal ring, and uh, we can play with uh, the different uh, faces. And so uh, it depends on the global accumulation of the phase along, along the curve, the particle will move uh, faster or lower, depend on that. And uh, you also, so here in this, uh, in this column, you have the time lapse uh, during the certain period time to see that exactly your particle following uh, the trajectory that we redesigned. Now we can uh, think about the other possibility. Can we also um, trap the nanoparticles? And we are speaking about the metallic nanoparticles. The metallic nanoparticles uh, uh, described in the uh, uh, dipole approximation, and they also have these two forces, one which is proportional to the intensity gradient, and uh, which is related to the real part of the particle parallelizability. And another one, which is depends on the phase gradient and is responsible to the imaginary part of the particle parallelizability. And uh, again, like in the case of the dielectrical particles, uh, uh, the, um, this force is always in the direction of the gradient of the phi, while this, in general, de uh, depends on the size uh, of uh, uh, alpha uh, prime, which can be uh, positive or negative, and uh, often it is too, too low uh, in order to trap the particles. So it is the case, in particular, when uh, we consider the, uh, so, so this is a picture for the, uh, the uh, gold nanoparticle sphere of the diameter of 80 nanometers, and you see that the alpha, uh, alpha prime can be negative if we are working with this wavelength. So we 
so it, it means that you cannot trap this particle using only the intensity gradient forces. But what we can do, we can use again the phase gradient forces to trap this particle and also to move them. But in that case, we cannot create the real three-dimensional trap. And what we do in these cases, we creating uh, uh, these traps against, uh, against uh, the, the cover slip, as it was also done for the case of the nanoparticles in the very primitive uh, trajectory. It's uh, again like in a, a ring or in a line where uh, the uh, simple um, uh, simple um, conversion cylindrical lenses were used. But in that case, they could use uh, the gradient, uh, intensity gradient forces to maintain the particle. So uh, what we use here, focusing the beam, we obtain some uh, channels near uh, this focusing where the nanoparticles are moved uh, inside, and after that, they moved along the trajectory in this plane. So you can see it uh, here for the two parts of the nanoparticles. One of them uh, are uh, spherical, and uh, they are uh, gold, and another one, they are triangle, and uh, they are silver particles. So we can also design the um, the trajectory according if we have some obstacles, as I said you before, uh, using for them the spline line combination. And uh, here you can see the, the laser traps behavior for the case uh, of For, for, uh, for the case when, uh, when the trajectory after that is changing according to what we want to obtain. And in the other picture, you can see also, uh, you can see also when uh, the stability of the strap and how it is, how it is, uh, maybe, maybe you will see it after that, how it is stable, how it is, uh, can uh, uh, now impact with uh, some obstacles, and after that you can move it uh, 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 together, all this uh, circle, in that case is a circular trajectory. Um, so if we going uh, to the part which is related to the uh, uh, to, to how we can construct the real three-dimensional trap, so we have to go again to the micro particles, uh, uh, micro size uh, particles, uh, which uh, with the refractive index which is larger than the environment. And uh, here you have also the some, some uh, uh, previous works, also the group of the grill, which show that the particle can move along the spiral trajectory. In general, it's only the half of the spiral. And what is important, that the particle can return back in the direction against the direction of beam propagation. So they also show that it's possible to do to these uh, um, um, two rings. So, so there are uh, two different type of the particle moving. And we also can do it. How we can do it? We only have, we consider that our 2D curve, which is dissolved before, it is a projection of our three-dimensional curve. And then playing with a certain type of the defocusing, we are able to create the course which you can, can see in this direction. And so we check that it's uh, again, experimentally realizable, so we can measure the intensity distribution. We can move the particles, uh, the, the, the polystyrene particles of the size more or less of the five microns, so it's more or less like a mean regime in this trap, and they will uh, follow uh, this uh, trajectory like a spiral, like an um, inclined course, etc. So uh, after that, you, if you like, you can try it. But uh, maybe uh, the more 
interesting thing in to look how we are, uh, it is uh, going we, when we consider it the one micron silicon nanoparticles. So you have such a wave uh, trap and they are going up and down, which is a time lapse you can see here. And uh, finally, you can see also what is going on in this, uh, in this case with these particles. And if you see, there is a quite complex combinations uh, of this movement because there is uh, some uh, bunching of the particles in some moment after that. So it is a very rich dynamics, particle dynamics that the people can study. Uh, uh, using such type of a, tri uh, a trap and considering that they are created only by the optical forces without any, uh, any other any non-controllable one. So uh, maybe I will stop in this point and uh, how to create it. You need the computer generated holograms. Some recipe and some uh, um, papers that I think are quite important uh, to understand how to create this hologra uh, these holograms using only face, only face, uh, uh, only face uh, uh, spatial light modulators is written uh, in this Arizona paper in uh, uh, 2008. And uh, so if you are interested, I can also speak with you and to, to make some recommendations. And finally, uh, in, in conclude, so this uh, type of what we call the polymorphic beam, because it can to change its form, are an important advance uh, in the direction of the transport of macro and nanoparticles and application for the cell scales for tetrarapy when you can uh, move the hot nanoparticles along a certain trajectory which will get surround, for example, the, the, uh, the cell for drug delivery, microreology, or uh, multiparticle dynamic study, etc. So thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for <laughs> <laughs>